stated that traffic bollards at the current terminus of Bailey Road and the provision of a lane linking Bailey Road to Page Road be accepted in lieu of the requirement for the implementation of the traffic study recommendations for the intersection of Bailey and Oracle. When the development of the Tyler Heights properties began, a temporary blockade at then the top, of, top end of Bailey Road was placed by the developer consisting of highway concrete road barriers. This was to prevent the passage of construction equipment, dump trucks, concrete trucks and the like from traveling up the narrow, steep and winding Bailey Road and into the development sites. Construction companies with their related trucks and equipment were notified to travel up Norwest Road to Dickerson Road, both of which are designed as main arterial routes in order to move materials and equipment to the Tyler Heights development area. Once the development was completed, the developer honored their commitment to install grass pavers and metal bollards where the temporary highway concrete barriers had been placed. Maxi Lane was then constructed linking the top end of Bailey Road at the Bollards with Page Road so that vehicles would not become trapped at the top end of Bailey Road at the Bollards. A few years later it was decided that some of the solid Bollards could be replaced with flexible poly spring loaded Bollards in order for emergency vehicles only to easily continue up Bailey Road into the Tyler Heights development if necessary. This was a good idea. So here are the many good reasons to retain the bollards near the top of Bailey Road Seashell. One, the bollards were installed as a permanent solution to the developer not having to build a cul-de-sac at the north end of Bailey Road, thus losing some building lots. This concession was made partly by the Bailey Road area residents in order to assist the developer to be able to proceed with their development of the Tyler Heights subdivision. In order for the developer of Tyler Heights uh, to proceed, all parties involved, West Seashelt Ratepayers Association, existing residents of Bailey Road and Connecting Roads, City Mayor, Councillors, Planning and Engineering Department, Seashelt Fire Department, and the developer for the Tyler Heights area, all agreed on these bullards being installed. Maxi Lane connecting Bailey Road to Page Road from the Bailey Road bullards serves well for the movement of vehicles in that area without them becoming trapped at the top end of Bailey Road. People such as myself made purchase of our properties and homes on and near Bailey Road, knowing that the bollards were in place, which brought us great comfort in knowing that the Oracle Heights neighborhood is safer and quieter without large volume vehicular traffic flows. Subsequent petitions over the last few years with over 100 signatures each time have clearly stated that the Bailey Road area residents are very passionate about keeping these bollards in place. Bailey Road was designed as a neighborhood road, not an arterial road, which is evidenced by the narrow width of the road, the unusually steep grade of the road, the curvatures on the road, and by the posted speed limit of only 30 kilometers per hour. Emergency vehicle access, if necessary, through the bollards to Tyler Heights development is virtually unimpeded by the flexible bollards, which allow 17 feet of clearance. A fire truck is eight feet, two inches wide. The bollards at Apollo Road, just off Bailey Road, see Exhibit A attached here, uh, were recently discovered by Wanda Key, resident of Apollo Road, residing just outside of the bollards, to have been accidentally installed on the strata section of, the, of Apollo Road. It is now recently confirmed that the strata council in Tyler Heights has assumed ownership of these bollards, which they have recently replaced, repaired, and brought up to new standards. The point here is that neither the District of Seashell nor the Tyler Heights Strata Council, including their strata insurers, have expressed any safety concerns over these same types of bollards. RMS Risk Management Services, consultants to the Municipal Insurance Program, have expressed in a very recent report to the Municipal Insurer that if the District of Seashell determines that there is enough space for emergency vehicles to drive over the flexible bollards, and get through, removal of the bollards will not be necessary. On April the 23rd, 2018, I was out in my yard working on some landscaping when I witnessed a very large ladder truck from the Seashell Fire Department making its way up Bailey Road on a non-emergency run. As it passed by my property, the fireman waved at me 
and drove through the flexible bollards with ease and continued on up Bailey Road through the Tyler Heights subdivision. So in conclusion, we say the Bailey Road bollards and Maxi Lane should be left in place to serve the purpose serve the purposes that they were intended for, embedded by unanimous agreement of the numerous parties involved and having these two solutions implemented so that the development permit would be issued to the Tyler Heights developer. We want the councillors and the mayor to make a motion and to second that motion to leave the bollards on Bailey as a status quo and that it be, that it be recorded in easy to access public records for future councillors, mayors, and as well as for the general public that these bollards remain in place so long as these residential developments remain. Recommendations though, that the yellow and black checkerboard signage at the bollards be replaced with a yellow and black signage saying emergency vehicles only. That would be the same as in the laneway with grass pavers off Highway 101 on the east side of the Silverstone development between the highway and the ocean and across the highway from Trail Bay Estates. There's an exhibit one attached showing that. And by the way, these bollards there are lo locked down with no flexible bollards for emergency vehicle access. On Apollo Road, just off Bailey Road, see exhibit two attached, uh, same signage there, emergency vehicles only. That the very misleading sign at Oracle Road on Bailey Road stating no exit be removed as it implies a dead end road which is not correct since vehicular traffic can easily exit by turning right at the bollards, going down Maxi Lane to Page Road, see exhibit three attached. Removing this sign would constitute an important measure of additional safety since emergency vehicles can go past Oracle Road, up Bailey Road, then go through the flexible bollards at the top of, of Bailey Road, as well as turning right onto Maxi Lane to Page Road residential houses if need be. This removal of this very misleading signage would also benefit the movement of public vehicles since Bailey Road connects to Page Road via Maxi Lane as a route out from the top of Bailey Road at the Bollards. Remember, Maxi Lane was constructed as per the original Tyler Heights Development Agreement in conjunction with the Bollards. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your presentation. Don't go away. Uh, there may be some uh, questions or clarifications right. from councillors, I'm not sure. And thank you for uh, getting a very long presentation, almost within our 10 minute. Thank you. Bylaw, but that's okay. You can take some time out of the fastball group that's okay. next. Um, so the first question is always to councillors whether there's any points for clarification or if you understood the submission and the requests that were there. Looks like there was lots of clarity. Um, thank you. I think, um, as you know, this has been a long-standing um, issue that's gone back and forth in various forms, at least twice in the last term of this council, if not more. Um, I have two, two concerns. In one sense, you've addressed them that um, repeatedly come in front of um, the staff. One of them is snow removal, and, and I think that, and the other one is emergency vehicles. Snow removal, I think, can probably be dealt with by our public works with a bit more attention and um, and awareness of uh, the issues there rather than just blocking up what's happened in the past is on we get what two heavy snowfalls every two years and they'll end up with a really thick bank of snow there that nobody could get through and I think in knowing in advance that that's the issue public works could probably pile the snow somewhere else or or shovel it out so that's more or less our our issue the one that concerns me much more is the uh, concern about emergency and particular medical emergency access and the, f the fact that there have been cases where we know the uh, emergency vehicles haven't been uh, sufficiently aware of how to access some of the homes on the <clears throat> either side of the bollards and for me that's uh, a very important issue and it's not one of numbers if, if you're, you or I are suffering from a heart attack. Um, we don't care if it's one person or 99 people don't want the bollards, we want the emergency vehicles. Or if your child is um, at risk from a drowning accident or whatever, um, we want to make sure emergency goes quickly. So I wondered um, if you had any comments on that one issue of medical emergencies. Well, I think I've addressed that on, on a few points that I brought up there. One being that there should be a change of signage for one. Mm -hmm. um, also, uh, it might be easier said than done, I don't know, but uh, anybody in the emergency service 
says to the uh, Seashell District, should be made aware that there are numerous bollards around uh, Seashell, not just the ones on Bailey Road and Apollo, but that they can pass through these. And uh, the other thing is that I saw a fire truck go through there on April the 23rd. It had no difficulty getting through it all. There's enough room to fit basically two fire trucks through that flexible bollards uh, area there. And I don't think there's an issue right now with the Apollo Road bollards either, and yet they're designed exactly the same way. So um, while it is a concern, I would be concerned about that as well too, but a little bit of education with the emergency service people in Seashelt as well as a change of signage about those two signs that I mentioned, the one that says no exit at Apollo or at uh, Oracle and Bailey and an emergency vehicle access only sign instead of a checkerboard sign at the top where the bollards are, I think would really help a lot as well too. Okay, I think the signage is a good suggestion. As Thanks. you know, our 911 calls end up in Vancouver and with dispatchers who are dispatching people who may or may not live in Seashelt, and that's part of the issue. And it's not just the rotation of RCMP and ambulance people, it's the fact that these are sometimes um, not just for holidays and vacations, but they rotate through a lower mainland district. So there have, there have been some risks that we, we want to take into account um, to ensure that uh, everyone has the community they want to live in. Anything else from councillors? Then thank you very much. We have your thank requests you and they'll be processed and they'll probably come back. Thank you everybody for your time. Thank you. Thanks. And that brings us to the second item on our agenda. Uh, Mr. Jim Gray, who's a league member of the Fastball, uh, Sunshine Coast Fastball Association, and he would like to speak to us today about the fastball at Hackett Park. Welcome, Mr. Gray. Softball away from you, Mr. But so make, sure you, make sure is, you don't uh, lose it because. <laughs> yeah, softball. Yeah, my name's Jim Gray. I, I'm a resident of Seashell since 1970 when I first moved here to teach at Seashell Elementary. Uh, I'm still employed by the school district. I've been in the community for 48 years and I've been a member of the uh, men's fastball uh, league since I moved here and that's 48 years. Um, the, the, the Hacker Park uh, was built by pioneers, five of who are still alive. Uh, these guys went out and they um, cleared the land uh, that was just a bush. They logged it, they planted grass. Uh, the, the fields that they were playing on uh, were, I think, were down at Selma Park, which is the boat, boat launching. That was the only field in Seashell uh, back in 1955 uh, when this field was, uh, was built. Um, do, does everybody has everybody got this uh, got this sheet of observations that I I sent? If you have, then uh, this isn't going to take really much time at all. But I think before I just touch on on the uh, the observations that I've made, um, I just can't for the life of me believe how this decision came about. Where uh, the representatives of the league received a letter uh, in January stating that um, uh, this fastball league that has been in existence for 63 years on the coast is now being shunted over to Kinnikinnick Park um, with no dialogue, with no consultation, with no discussion with any of the members of, of the group. Um, this was the way it was and in the interim, of course, since the beginning of the season, there's been emails and there's been letters back and forth and without getting into that, um, I, I, I just, like I say, I, I, I'm just totally flummoxed that this is the way the decision was made and there was no, um, uh, no discussion. So the league abided by the decision. They decided, let's go and let's we'll try to play at Kinnikinnick. And for the last three weeks, they've done that. I've, I've umpired uh, five, six games, I believe now, up at Kinnikinnick and um, um, You've, 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 seen, you've seen the things that are concerned to uh, the players and the representatives of the league. First of all, I think the people that were in decision making really didn't understand that there was a difference between uh, slow pitch and fastball. I outlined that in, number, in, uh, in point one. In point two, um, 
the, the number of balls that the league are losing in the bushes, the brambles around the parks, the, sim the simple fact is I don't think the league will be able to survive till the first week in August. Um, they're just, I think at Hackett Park, in the 48 years that I played in umpire, I don't think they've lost a ball. The fencing around the park uh, does a fabulous job of keeping 95% of the balls in play. Um, as far as safety, people walking uh, along the pathway at Kinnikinnick, the, uh, the adventure playground, I'm, I'm, I've got a, a four and a three and an 18 month old grandson and, and they play in that little um, playground. Uh, on the first game that we umpired, thank goodness nobody was playing, um, but three balls went straight through the park, those balls. A ball like that hits a toddler playing uh, in the sand pile or on the swings is going to cause some serious damage and it could, could, could be worse. So um, it just simply is, is not a place for fastball at this stage of the game. The safety issue, which is probably the, the most important, um, there's not a safer park or not a safer place to play in uh, Sea Shelton and Hackett Park. Like I say, the balls, 95% of them stay in the field. Um, people can walk around, they're really not in any danger. Um, the, uh, there's, a, there's a thought, I think, that uh, balls are flying out of the park, home runs are being hit. In the games that I've umpired this year, um, there might have been two balls that went over the fence at Hackett Park, uh, either the Northeast Diamond or the Southwest Diamond. The ball would generally land on the road or the sidewalk and roll into somebody's front yard been doing that for 63, well not 63 years because there wasn't always houses there. In fact, I don't think there were houses there in 1970 when I moved here. Um, but um, uh, safety, the biggest concern, uh, Kinnikinnick is not a safe ballpark for, uh, for fastball to be played at. Uh, the bleachers um, that we talked about um, are the two of the best beaches, the district refurbished and painted the bleachers a year and a half ago, and uh, they're comfortable, they're big, they'll hold 100 people. Um, the, uh, the seniors walk across from the apartments, people in the village come and watch on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday for eight weeks during the year. And uh, we have wheelchair people that come down from Shorncliffe and sit under the trees on the Southwest Diamond. The balls stay in the park for the most part because of those trees uh, along the southwest diamond and, and uh, likewise down on the northeast diamond. The ball gets hit up into the trees, they tumble down. And, uh, and, and at, at this ball field too, uh, for 48 years, I've never, there's never been a serious injury from anybody uh, that has been hit by a, a foul ball, a softball. Um, the, uh, the players are pointing at the ball, the people in the stands are hunching over, they see it. Uh, there's one real simple solution, which, which Perry Schmidt had mentioned to me, he was talking about putting netting up at Kinnikinnick. Put netting up at Kinnikinnick, that's a great idea. But put netting up at Hackett, and then the lone individual who's been complaining about uh, fearing for her life from a softball um, will have no fear anymore because the netting can come out and the balls will stay right down in and around the park. Um, so, so that's 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 the bleachers. Uh, it's the only place to watch a game, uh, and I think they had a game there uh, a week ago, and there was probably a hundred people. If you saw the pictures in the paper, these are most of these people were people that came from the apartments and from Shorncliffe and some some from um, um, the the uh, houses just around the the uh, development there. Uh, and vehicles, well, this is just a no-brainer. If you've got a brand new car, you don't want to park beside the ball field because the balls occasionally do flip out of play and you're going to get a dint uh, or a cracked windshield. Uh, the people that I've known um, for 48 years that live along Hackett Park, during ball season, they park in the lane behind. There's no issues. If, you're, if, you, if you park your car right beside the field, well, yeah, you're taking a risk. Um, so those those were the main the main items. Uh, like I say, I for 48 years the only broken windshield I've got was when I parked my car up at uh, watching a slow pitch tournament. Like a fool, I parked by the fence and I cracked my windshield. But it's never happened at Hackett Park because I don't park there. I park down on Pebble Crescent. 
Finally, and this is almost beyond belief, but um, last Wednesday, last Wednesday when we were at the ball game, um, Doug Saunders, who's the owner of Custom Carpet, uh, needed to go out and just practice some pitching because he was going to have to pitch that night. Uh, there was just him and another player, and as he was pitching from the mound at like a close connection field, a golf ball landed about 15 feet from him, and uh, he went, holy smokes. Uh, I got to the field about 15, 20 minutes later, and um, uh, uh, Kelly Hamlin, his mother and father, were coming to watch the game. They were settling down into the really comfortable aluminum bench that, or aluminum uh, seats that were sitting just behind the dugouts. And uh, they had just put their blanket down, were sitting down, and a ball came through the trees, over the fence, hit the road, and hit the chain link fence 10 feet from them. Uh, and that's this ball. Uh, when I got to the field and they told me that, I, I went, holy smokes. Uh, that is in unbelievable. Now, I golf all the time. I'm a fairly decent golfer. I can't hit the fence uh, at the driving range. My grandson, who's six foot two, uh, an athlete, he, he comes out on the course and he can drive a golf ball 300 yards. Well, there used to be netting up that the golf course had that went up and it's just literally deteriorated to the point where it's not, they're not stopping. And so some of these young guys now that'll go out and take a bucket of balls, um, they, they can hit a golf ball 300 yards and 300 yards is beyond the, the pitching mound at Kinnikinnick. Uh, I, I, just, I just shake my boots thinking people sitting in those aluminum bleachers looking at a ball game not knowing that some young guy is coming up and is going to hit a ball over the fence, through the you know above the prickles and through the alder trees and hit somebody on the head, 175 miles an hour, it's going to kill somebody. And I don't know whether that's the district of Seashell's problem or whether it's the golf course's problem, but this would be a serious, serious and a major issue if anything ever happened. So our committee is here tonight, and we are asking that, uh, and this seems to me to be a pretty simple decision. We're asking, uh, be, because the decision was made the way it was, we're asking that, uh, with a show of hands tonight, maybe the mayor and council uh, allow the fastball players to continue to play this season. There's only about three weeks left. Um, play the rest of these games at, uh, at Hackett Park, which is a much safer venue uh, for fastball. And at the end of the season, sit down with the people, the decision makers, and discuss, actually have a discussion about what the fastball league needs to do to either improve what some of the complaints have been, uh, whether they can uh, put a porta potty on the corner, that's already been suggested by a couple of the players, they would fund that. Um, put netting up over the backstop so that the, the, uh, the lady who is in fear for her life uh, will not have to see any of those foul balls uh, land in her yard. Um, so, uh, and, and I think at the end of it, you can come to an agreement and can make some decisions uh, in a logical, meaningful way, discussion. Questions? Thank you for your presentation. Are there any questions from Councillor? That was rather clear as well, but... Comments, Councillor Wheeler. Yeah, I think one of the things in your presentation that um, that I've been thinking about a lot is the issue of the uh, playground at Kinnikinnick. And anybody who's been there uh, over the summer has seen that there are balls headed towards that, and the outfielders are basically defending those kids in a it's lot scary. of plays. Yeah. Um, it's something that really just can't continue. So I'm glad that that has been raised, so that Council's aware of that, um, and then we can make our park staff aware of that there. I think the, one of the key issues that we're dealing with here is that um, these sports, including golf uh, and baseball, with uh, these high-velocity balls um, in play, really require a little extra work to house them in, in a safe way. So, I mean, it's not something that we should turn a blind eye to, but try to find the solutions, and I thank you for bringing that. Thank you, uh, Councillor Mueller. Anything else? And thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, as you know, there's been quite a bit of exchange back and forth, and this will continue that exchange. Um, just as an aside, I wanted to say one of the things I noted in the um, exchanges with uh, Mike Faucus, who represents the association, was that I was reminded, as I was in 2014 when I first met Mike, that he'd be an excellent person to have on council. So 
just put that out there. He's uh, deliberate, thinks things through, lots of detail, and remains very calm in all of his uh, presentations. So uh, thank you for that. Um, and thank you for your presentation. We'll be considering this. Do you have any idea as to when the decision may, may be, uh, it won't may be, be forthcoming? It won't be tonight. No. Nope. Um, we thank you for your, we understand the game that was played a week ago. And I think your point was made fairly clearly. We hope that that was uh, a point well taken and, and not continuing. Yeah, we want the seniors activity. in the district and the people that have been coming to the park and some of these old timers, they simply can't make it to Connect yeah. uh, Park. There's no bus service and they don't have rides. So um, they're losing out. I think we all understand the issues. Okay. It's just that we disagree on the final decision so far. So we'll consider it again. Thank you. Okay, and thank you for your attendance tonight. And now we'll move on uh, to our the regular parts of our agenda. We have no proclamations. We do have the minutes of the 4 p.m. regular council meeting of June 20th, uh, which is item 5.1, pages 14 to 22. Sorry, that's the seven o'clock meeting. Motion to receive and adopt. Thank you, Councillor Lutz and Councillor Mueller. And are there any errors or omissions in those minutes? Councillor Seegers. Thank you. On page 17, recommendation number five, um, I had indicated that I wanted my vote recorded on that. Yes. Thank you. Make note on recommendation five. Councillor Seegers had voted in favor of the recommendation. Any other errors or omissions? Seeing none, all those in favor of the agenda as amended. That's carried, none opposed. And are, is there any business arising from those minutes? If there's no business arising, we'll move on to item seven, 7.1, 7 which are the minutes of the Public Works, Parks and Environment Committee. A motion to receive and adopt, Councillor Lutz, Councillor Seegers, thank you. Now, are there any of those recommendations that need to be pulled out, or can they all go forward? Operations overview, marsh upgrade, emergency monies for the marsh, traffic counts. If not, I'll look for a recommendation to adopt recommendations number Three, two, eight. Councillor Inkster as the chair. Councillor Lutz seconding. All those in favor? That's any opposed? That's carried. And we move to our bylaws. Item 8.1. The first bylaw to consider is the zoning amendment bylaw number 25294, which is regarding the Grove Art Gallery, and I'll turn to our Director of Planning. First, a motion to receive the report. Uh, Councillor Seegers, thank you, and Councillor Wright, all those in favor of receipt. And I'll turn now to our Director of Planning to speak quickly to this. You got a dead microphone? Maybe hold it for a long time. We can, can borrow the one next to you. Thank you, Your Worship, members of council. Uh, the report in front of you is to receive the minutes of the public hearing that was held for the Grove Art Gallery. This is a text amendment. Uh, it applies to the Comprehensive Development Zone 30. Uh, the public hearing was held on June 19th. At that time, no one spoke to the amendment. It has been, uh, judging from our referral process, the meeting that we uh, that the applicants had on March 22nd, as well as the public hearing, uh, it's been very positively received uh, by the community. 
Uh, the reason that it does require an amendment is that in this particular district, they are limited to what is defined under specialty commercial, and it um, limits the size. Um, it also doesn't include that, that particular use. So the effect of this text amendment is to allow for a commercial art gallery in the Toretto building at a size that is larger than the current restriction at 100 square meters, and it's at 151. Um, so the recommendation in front of you is to receive the public hearing minutes and then to give second and third reading to the amending bylaw. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. So let's move to the recommendations. The first be that the minutes of the public hearing um, from June 19th be received. Councillor Shanks, Councillor Mueller, all those in favor? Given that nobody spoke at the public hearing, those were quick and easy. And now the zoning amendment bylaw number 25 be given second and third readings. That's moved by Councillor Seegers and Councillor Wright. All those in favor? That's carried. And that takes us then to the bylaws in question. Interesting that there was a size restriction on art. What kind of community would put a size restriction on art? I'm glad we're changing it. So second reading of bylaw number 25294-2018, Grove Art Gallery, which is a bylaw to amend District of Seashelt zoning bylaw number 251987 by defining and including the use of commercial art gallery as a permitted use in the Comprehensive Development Zone 30, CD30, Pacific Spirit Properties, Torito Development, is moved by Councillor Seegers and Councillor Wright, seconds. All those in favor? And there's none opposed. And third reading of bylaw number 25294-2018, the Grove Art Gallery, is moved by Councillor Mueller and Councillor Shanks. All those in favor? That's carried. So second and third reading, it'll come back for adoption um, shortly. And for adoption, um, bylaw number eight, or item 8.2 on the agenda, a bylaw regarding Vanta Pacific Limited and a small hotel, boutique hotel. First, a motion to receive the report. Councillor Seegers, thank you for that, and Councillor Lutz, all those in favour? That's carried, and I'll look to the Director of Planning to speak to the report with a good microphone. Thank you, Worship, members of Council. The report in front of you on, on this is a zoning amendment bylaw 25258-2013 for Vanta Pacific Limited. This is for a boutique hotel as well as guest cottages and other tourist accommodation. Um, it has been in process for quite some time. As you can see, this was in 2013. The effect of it was initially to rezone the area from R1 to C3. Um, it had received third reading in August of 2013. That was subject to several conditions. And so the effect of this report is to acknowledge that those conditions have been met and to seek the final reading. It does have, um, in, in the recommendations of number two and three, it has a technical amendment here to rescind third reading um, and to redo that. And that's simply because when they severed it from the strata lot, it changed the legal description on it. Um, for the plan number and the PID. And so it, in order to make sure that the amending bylaw is, is true to the, the new identifier, that was required in, in that regard. Um, they had met all the conditions. They are listed in the report. Um, the servicing agreement has been signed. I will note on the staff report itself, under the proposal, there was a slight inconsistency between what is worded there and what is on the bylaw. The bylaw is correct. I did check that with the author. Um, and so what it had said in the phase one part in the proposal, that is on page 48 of your report, that the hotel itself was not to exceed two stories. The bylaw is to have it not exceed three stories. I think the reason it showed up is the two in there is actually sunk into the slope. It reads as though it's two, but the bylaw itself is suggesting the three stories. And then in the second phase, it includes um, both the guest cottages and the two-story guest townhouse suites. So that's the effect of the amendment. 
Um, as mentioned, all the conditions have been met. So the recommendations were first to do the uh, rescinding of third and um, provide the new amendment to give third reading, um, to consider all the conditions of adoption for the zoning bylaw amendment to have been completed, and to provide adoption to the zoning amendment bylaw itself. That concludes my presentation. Thank you for the presentation, and I'll look to Council to see if there's any uh, queries or clarifications on this, and there is from Councillor Mueller. Yes, thank you. I'm glad to see this back before us. It was one of the first things we did when we got in um, as a Council. Uh, but I'm, I've been curious about how the uh, the issue of the development permit plays in um, here on in your background. It's listed as it was approved in principle, and so um, in that mind, then it didn't trigger the uh, the two year limit for a DP. Is that correct? The development permit itself was approved. Um, we do have it. It was approved December 2014. Okay, and so that has not expired then? No. Okay. How long would that development permit normally be um, open? Um, I, sorry, I'd have to check on that because there were a series of amendments. There was actually a development variance permit done, mm -hmm. I, I believe, last Unstop. year. Yeah. And so I wasn't sure at that time. Um, so I wasn't aware of the, the so complete that might be file a new date. that actually did extend at that time. Okay, thank you. Any other queries from Council? One I had, and it's just a general, it's not specific to this property, um, but it's not the first property that's been before us in this term that started its life as a strata and um, didn't get completed as a strata and then re-emerged in another redevelopment form at the end. Are there any particular implications of that for this property? Uh, to respond, no, not on this. It is not as complicated as some of the others that have been um, brought before you for your enjoyment. Um, it is actually fairly straightforward in this regard. Okay, thank you for that. And if there's no other questions, I would look for somebody to move recommendations two through six. Councillor Seegers, Councillor Mueller, and all those in favour. That's carried. And that would take us then to the bylaw itself, which is page 50, and uh, page 51 is what we want to look at. I'll look first for a motion to rescind the existing third reading of bylaw number 25258-2013, Vanta Pacific Limited, which is a bylaw to amend District of Seashell zoning bylaw number 25-1987 by rezoning a waterfront property on Ripple Way from R1 to C3. Thank you, Councillor Seegers and Councillor Lutz. All those in favour? With that rescinded, then we look at the bylaw that's actually in front of us with the amendments for the property details and the PIN numbers. And I'd look for somebody to move third reading of bylaw number 25258-2013, Vanta Pacific Limited. Councillor Mueller and Councillor Seegers, all those in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. And sorry, where's my recommendations? We can do adoption tonight as well. In that case, I'll look for adoption of zoning bylaw number 25258-2013. Councillor Lutz, I saw your hand first, and Councillor Wright. All those in favor? That's carried. That's really good to see. It started in 2012, 2013. It's been sitting at the developers since we looked at it in 2015, very early, so glad to see that they're moving forward. New business, there is none. Moving to item 10 on our agenda, we have several business items to deal with, and the first is a report on short-term rental and enforcement issues. Motion to receive the report. Councillor Lutz and Shanks, all those in favour? That's carried. And could I ask you to speak to this as well, please? <coughs> Busy night for Director Corbett. Yes, I'm earning my key. Thank you, Your Worship, members of the Council. This is a, a for information report. It came um, as a request from at the time of the June 6 Council regarding some bylaw and neighbor issues related to a short term rental located in the district, um, as well as a request to review a number of approaches related to short term rentals in terms of how they're regulated. 
um, both through the district and in other municipalities. So the report in front of you looked at what we do as the district, how it is regulated, both through the zoning bylaw and through the business license requirements, as well as some additional bylaws I listed where if we do have um, whether it's noise complaints or other enforcement issues, what bylaws apply in that regard. Um, I also did a fair bit of research both through um, some of our surrounding municipalities, particularly in tourist-oriented um, areas that have been struggling with the same kind of issue to look at what they have done, uh, what their reports have addressed, their enforcement mechanisms, as well as some in the U.S. Um, because they tend to take a little bit of different legalistic approach, so I looked at a few of, of those. So that's contained within the report of what some of the examples are. Um, in, in looking at it, it I, in some cases, in terms of our business license aspect, it's quite detailed. It has uh, a number of provisions in it. There are some things that in, in Seashelt we're fairly permissive on that a lot of municipalities are not quite as permissive on in terms of we do make it a permitted use in a number of zones, both in R1, R2, and R3. So that's uh, the R1 is allows and quite the, there's quite a bit of that, so it allows it in a lot of the zones throughout the district. It restricts it to single detached development there is no restriction on it being in secondary suites, and that is something that is um, very clearly regulated in some other municipalities as a way to control the rental market. Um, we do uh, allow the, the option for, well, we don't require someone to be actually a resident um, within in the unit. Some other municipalities are very clear that it needs to be owner occupied and it's limited to um, a certain number of, of days per the year. So in, um, in the district we are quite lenient on that. Um, so it puts a fair bit of onus on the enforcement on our bylaw officers through the business licensing as opposed to um, a lot of strictness in the zoning bylaw itself. So it leaves you with um, a number of, of options on um, if there needs to be any alteration to that. Um, I will say in terms of the uh, issue that raised the concern initially, we are going through um, bylaw enforcement actions on that. The owners are well aware of that, as are the neighbors. I am in touch with them on a fairly regular basis. Um, and so we are moving down a road into progressive enforcement on that. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you for your report and presentation. I'm sure there will be questions and comments. Councillor Mueller, first. Yeah, thank you. I, I just wanted to um, ask a question about housing affordability and availability. Um, in your report, you mentioned some statistics there, and um, it didn't actually say exactly which statistics were from where and which of those could apply to the Sunshine Coast or the BC context. Those were the only ones, they, they don't apply to Sunshine Coast. Those were from um, a US report uh, that did some analysis on that. Uh, it applied to a very large metropolitan area, I believe it was San Diego. Um, so it, it gave an order of magnitude that, that had some interest in it. What it did show was it wasn't a, a direct correlation into it. I think because it's relatively recent in into the Canadian market in certain areas, there just isn't a lot of research available uh, over time of what it has done, because sometimes it takes a while to work through the market to see what it's doing. In a lot of areas that do have short-term rentals, when you think of places like Canmore and Banff, Tofino, Uculet, Nelson is, is a huge one. Um, they've had affordability issues long before the short-term rental came in. So it, it's challenging to look at causality. There's certainly some correlations in there, um, but it's, it's kind of adding more to a hot market already. Yeah, no, I, I wanted to ask the question because I think that uh, in this context here on the Sunshine Coast, it's it's important to understand just exactly how this is working. We don't have the data, um, but we have a lot of people asking us to do something about this. Um, and I, I also, the other thing that I noted in your report was that people actually aren't making official complaints. Um, they may be complaining um, to us verbally or 
through the media or letters to the editor, but they're not making official complaints. So if there is actually, we need to know um, in your neighborhood if there is an issue with this stuff, you need to make an official complaint. If you have a complaint, um, then we can really kind of track this a little bit better, but we know the impact is large. And anecdotally speaking to anyone who's come up against the affordability crisis, they blame, they put the blame squarely on uh, short-term rentals uh, more than anything else eating up the rental stock. So um, I think there's a lot more work to do here. I think I'd like to see um, us really tackle this perhaps in a workshop, but through the lens of our um, strategic plan, which has a lot of social goals in it that uh, could be impacted by short-term rentals. And we just haven't done the work. Thanks. Thank you for that. And other comments, Councillor Inkster? Yes, thank you. This issue has been uh, in front of Council over a number of terms and years, and we've talked about it over a number of those years. Uh, and it was, as many of us know, that it was a big issue in the late 1990s and early 2000s. And we put in some uh, rules at that time to deal with some of the concerns. The issues that I hear from, and if in fact people aren't reporting them I'm assuming anonymously to our staff to get them investigated and take that route because obviously as the director of planning has mentioned there is some enforcement and some discussion with the homeowners that does occur is the issues that I hear about is parking and there's a big one that that's the complaint that I get I uh, just received one a couple of weeks ago about somebody with some concerns and saying that there was the parking issue in there their neighborhood and also and of course noise that goes on past the regular nighttime noise of uh, of our community and those citizens that live there and also those that work regularly during the day so that's sort of a conflict issue that I've been hearing uh, and and I think that it it's probably touches on it a little bit or it's or end or it's uh, in the lexicon of the discussion is it's not just short-term rentals it's Airbnb that is also forcing some people uh, out of um, the rental market um, in some cases so that the Airbnb can be provided as a form of accommodation. So that's what I've been hearing also as well. So um, I'm hoping that's under consideration and some of those issues are discussed as we move forward in order to make sure that our community's uh, livable for our permanent residents. Thanks. And Councillor Lutz and then Councillor Wright. Thank you. And I really want to thank staff for bringing this report. It gives us as many questions as it answers. Uh, there's lots to, of work to do around this issue. Um, we all hear from workers in the community that are having a terrible time finding rentals, and this feeds into it. So I think we have to get the word out to neighbors of short-term rental accommodations to let us know what the issues are and maybe it, it needs to be more than just a workshop but maybe a town hall to get some feedback from the community. I, I know that there are people in the community that do rental um, counts and costs and hopefully they could get us that information. Uh, the affordable housing group has done it in the past. I don't know when their most current numbers have been tallied, but uh, it would be good to hear from them again. And thank you for the report. Uh, Councillor Wright and then Councillor Seegers. Oh, thank, thank you, Your Worship. Um, one of the difficulties I have is good information in the report, and so I thank you for the report. The complaint-driven uh, bylaw um, is, is an issue for me because I know that after 4.30 on a Friday afternoon, um, there is nobody to complain to. And a lot of these rentals are taking place on weekends, and like many of our bylaws, they happen after after hours, after 4.30 in the, in the day. So that becomes an issue, and I and I just don't think that people are getting through with, with their complaints and um, if, they're, if they're registering them at all. I guess for me, the information is good as far as it goes, and the question I have is, and what are we gonna do next? And in what sort of a time frame are we going to do that? I, I think people sitting at this side of the table see that this is an issue, and it's a big issue in our community, and I think we're looking to address that fairly quickly with some recommendations and, and some short time on that. 
And so um, if you have a comment on what is next and the timing, I'd be, I'd appreciate it. I thought that was actually council's question and that's where I was going to get when people had mentioned if it's up to you, up to us as a council, not to staff to do what's next. So I was gonna be looking for suggestions. We've heard them ranging from workshops to different enforcements. So please, for the other councillors, start putting that in your mind. Um, what do you want as a council to do next? It was a good report, but it's, but it's to be directed at us. And Councillor Seegers. Thank you. On page 54, when you, you have a little paragraph there where you talk about current activity levels, you indicated that on Airbnb, there were 153 active short-term rentals in the District of Seashelt, but only about 60% of those have business licenses. So there are, as we know, many out there that aren't following our, by our bylaws, our guidelines, and those typically would then would be the ones that are creating the issues. And because we are uh, con complaint driven, unless somebody tells us about them, complains about them, we don't actually do anything. I think one of the things that we'd have to look at in our jurisdiction would be one of the questions that the SCRD actually looked at when they looked at this issue. They assumed that removing short-term rentals would translate to more long-term rentals. When they actually polled their residents, they found that that wasn't the case. Many people who actually had short-term rentals did not want to have long-term renters. They didn't want to deal with Landlord-Tenant Act. They didn't want to have to deal with evicting tenants or any of the you know, issues that come up with long-term tenants. So some may turn into long-term rentals. Most probably won't. The other side of that is people who are doing short-term rentals, not all cases, but there are some cases where that actually helps them be able to afford to live in their house themselves. If they didn't have the short-term rental, sometimes they couldn't afford to live here either. So all of those issues come into play when we start looking at how do we address this and how do we move it forward. There were a couple of questions in your report, um, a couple of things that you indicated I had questions about. Um, on page 55, you indicated that our business license bylaw limits the number of properties a local contact can manage to two if they're not the registered owner of the property. Could you give us what the reason it would be for that provision? Through the chair, the notion of that is to keep the short-term rentals to a residential owner as opposed to uh, those who own multiple investment properties and, and put them in a rental pool or short-term rental pool. Um, so it was a, a certain check and balance on that, that number. There are communities where they've had a lot of problems with the multiple listing agencies that, that have a number of them. So it means you've got absentee land owners. Um, and it can create some issues and, and where some have found problems is it's leading to the micro hotel issue where you've got multiple units within the house, no one is living there and it's a constant turnover. And, and that's really commercializing into a residential community as opposed to I think the initial intent in a lot of cases where you've got an opportunity to generate some revenue out of your house when the occupants are out, someone's in and the intensity of use is negligible in that case. It's not turning over as, as often. Um, so that was the intent behind that. Okay. Um, on page 56, you uh, reference the noise bylaw, and you say that um, typically, and this is to Councillor Wright's um, mention as well, the disturbance is after hours. So how does how is enforcement done after hours given our bylaw officers don't work those hours? Uh, through the chair, so there are two options that, that happen here. One is if it is an um, occurring problem and it's um, significant, they will often call the police at that time. 
Where we usually interface with it is we'll have a message waiting at Monday morning uh, for the bylaw officers that uh, this is a problem and we can track down the property and take action at that time because at that point they're in breach of their business license as well. Um, so we can, we can tick it at that point, but it's after the fact, definitely. Okay, uh, Councillor Shanks, and then I'll put myself on the list. I have a few issues as well, Councillor yeah. Shanks. Yeah, I was over a period of time. I've experienced that there there appears to be a, a disconnect between the bylaw enforcement officers and the RCMP in terms of carrying out our bylaws when our bylaw enforcement officers are not on duty, and I think that's a, a fair size issue which we should address and invite the RCMP. Should we have a workshop or something of that nature? in the near future. Thank you. And uh, just a few things that I had, and just to start with the follow-up to Councillor Shank's issue, I regularly um, remind the staff sergeant or acting staff sergeant in our meetings that they are there to enforce the noise bylaw in particular. Um, they often talk to me about staffing and shortages and things like that, but I remind them what their role is in this. And it has to be um, pressed upon the community that just because an offense takes place on the weekend or after hours, the lack of a complaint on our phones on Monday morning um, tells us that nothing happened that weekend. So it is really up to individuals to let us know um, so we can follow up and, and see what we can do there. Like others, I was struck by the comment in the report that overall, there's very few complaints with regard to short-term rentals. So we hear things anecdotally and we hear people say that they're affected, but the, the actual hard data doesn't um, back that up. Um, equally so on page 54, where you say there's not a direct correlation between homes used for short-term rentals and loss of rental units. And uh, I would concur with Councillor Seegers. There's a number of reasons for why that's the case. And there is not a du direct correlation. One of them being that many of the, many, I'd say at least 50% of these short-term rentals are one to two to three million dollar waterfront homes that are not going to be converted into residential rental market anyways. They simply aren't going to be used for that. Um, there are some uh, more typical residential properties that are used as short-term rentals, but they're more the exception uh, depending on their location than what it is. One question I had for you, and then I was going to come back to that issue of affordability, was the relationship between our short-term rental um, bylaws and understanding which in which the resident does not have to live on the property but can rent it out, and our bed and breakfast bylaws where typically there is an owner resident who may rent out complete suites. Um, but is on the premises. And the difference between short-term rental and three or four night bed and breakfast situation and how, how, we've, how we've created gaps or not, what's happened there? If. Through the chair. So with bed and breakfast, there's actually a lot more checks and balances on it. There's a lot more controls on it. Um, you, it it's an accessory use. Um, it's uh, restricted it a lot more than the short-term rental. There's requirements for the, the owner-operator, so you don't have the absentee landlord. There's restrictions on the number of sleeping units and the num total number of guests. So the, the bed and breakfast has a lot more zoning regulations on it. We don't leave it as much to the business license to control. Um, so that that limits the startups uh, of it. So it's a lot more controlling. With the short-term rental, when it's the the bylaw zoning bylaw is, is fairly permissive with it. It leaves it puts a lot of the onus on the business license enforcement. But as you can see in those numbers, an awful lot don't even have business license. So our ability to enforce gets very limited on it, which is why I think they it might be helpful to bring those a little bit more into conformity that we're actually regulating both in, in a way through the zoning bylaw in addition to business license, but having a few more restrictions on where they go, how they go, because it's much easier to enforce through zoning than it is through business license. OK. 
Okay. Um, Councillor Seeger, is that a follow-up on this issue? No, or, no well, Then I have another one, okay, if you don't thanks. mind. I just want to go back to the fact that there's not a correlation between short-term rentals and loss of rental units necessarily, but there is a direct correlation between what I would call the monetization of residential properties and the pricing and affordability of those houses. So as soon as you um, turn a residential properties into investment vehicles, whether that's for speculation, potential capital gains, or the generation of income through short-term rentals, or even rental units, you're changing the price structure. And, and we have to take that quite seriously, because um, if there's two people bidding on a property, and one of them is an average wage earner who wants to live in the property, and somebody else is an investor who um, has financial, uh, is looking at as a looking at it as a financial instrument, they can't compete because the numbers simply won't, won't work out for the, for the one. And that's happened across North America. It's well documented um, and probably half the people in this room have participated in that in one way or another. So it's not a, a new idea, but it does directly affect the issues of affordability when we're trying to um, think through the long-term impact of how our community, we want the right mix in the community. And obviously we don't want to say no to investment um, dollars and uh, and those who want to enter the community in some ways, but we also want to make sure that we don't say no or set up barriers for people who want to live and work here or simply live here for 40 or 50 years. We have to find that balance. So with that, I'd look to Councillor Seegers, and then I'm going to come back and ask for advice on what to do next, where we should take this to get it moving forward. Councillor Seegers. A year or two ago, I think most of us attended a session at UBCM on short-term rentals. One of the the people who was on the panel was um, the head of the BC Hotel Association. And what he said to the people in attendance was, unless we get a handle on short-term rentals in our communities, hotels won't come because it's an uneven playing field. So that's just another argument for us to actually do something about this, one way or another. I don't know if we've heard enough from the community because we're all weighing in on, on all sides, right? So. And thank you for that reminder. I have actually talked to hotelers, hoteliers um, about coming to Seashelt, and we can say, oh, we've only got the Bella Beach, which is hardly open, and the Driftwood, and they'll say, no, no, Bruce, I'm not coming here. There's 250 rooms that I'm competing with and they're spread out in all the best locations. <laughs> and, and that's a real, real factor. So thank you for that reminder as well. So next steps, do we refer this back to staff and ask them to have a um, workshop with more detail? Do we um, take it into the community to see about enforcement levels? We were um, previously, last year, we were actually trying to work in step with the SCRD. Um, I would say that that was well intended, but they ended up not wanting to do anything and their community told them that bed and breakfast were not a problem. Um, our community has been telling us it's something to, we do need to look at. So um, I'd look to council on some suggestions on where you'd like the next step to be. And I see Councillor Mueller and Councillor Inkster. It's tough because of the timing with the political cycle. Um, this is a big thing to, to, to chomp into, but I, I, I don't I think totally that's forgot. Yeah. I don't think um, it's it's, Sorry, I lost my train of thought there. <laughs> it's that political cycle. It interrupts yeah, it's everything. It's political cycle. Um, no, but I think that we can we can potentially start to get some of the information together, which is which is really good, and for councillors, especially the ones that are going to be running again, um, to start to think about how to do this. This is this is a full day of, of work and workshopping. Uh, we know what the issues are. We just have to come up with a really clear way of addressing um, and finding the balance, which is the magic of it. Um, but I uh, would urge staff, as we're going through this, to, to look at the examples set by Whistler. Um, Whistler is one of those unique communities in BC, but it has uh, the same issues that we have in terms of affordability and, um, and the short-term rental situation. Um, it's on steroids, and so the way that they dealt with it um, there it, it really uh, might provide some insight into what, what makes sense here. They've got a lot more experience with it and uh, they've tried a couple different versions. So um, that's all I have to say. I take a suggestion out of that, but I'll listen to Councillor Inkster. 
Yeah, the, I mean, there's a number of communities that we've heard about over the years. Tofino's another one. And uh, we, we met, this council knows that there's a very fairly active council and mayor that could be easily uh, talked to uh, through various means to see what they're doing with those particular issues in those town, to, towns to give us ideas. I do know that in 2009, I believe, I'm trying to think if the short, I think short-term rentals was involved, but we engaged the B&B Association, B&Bs and short-term rentals to talk about, uh, and we had a number of them talk and uh, engage with us about some changes in, in property, property basically uh, per property fees for the u utilization of uh, municipal services. Uh, because we were looking at uh, some additional amounts based on the usage being made of the services. So um, uh, there, was a, there, there was a lot of discussion. The, there were some strong arguments made by to not uh, necessarily in some cases make those changes. But what it pointed to was the engagement of those groups fairly quickly in the municipal process to discuss with us their industry, how they saw it, how they see it fit in our community and any changes that they would suggest that we should make to to uh, either control and or have enforcement in areas that need enforcement. Because of course, with any business and or, in this case with the B&Bs and or short-term rentals, there's the, there's the uh, good operator owners, and then there's the, one, the ones that are not necessarily registered as a business license even to start, but also not, not following the rules that are set up in our town could be because they don't live here or they're hoping that we don't catch them. Although a lot of the uh, rent short-term rentals probably could be, if they don't have a business license, we probably could catch them by simply searching the internet, uh, short-term rental and Seashelt. I mean, that's how those that are renting them are finding out about them other, through, other than through word of mouth, but that seems to be rare. So we did engage them, and I see no reason why we couldn't look at speaking to the groups involved, because a lot of, if we, st if we think that we don't know necessarily who they are, a lot of B&Bs also deal with short-term rentals, so there's a fairly straight line connected between the two because it's it's the it's the industry they're in or the occupation that they have that means that there's there's a, those two things going on under one set of roofs. Thanks. Okay, thank you, and that's good suggestions. And Councillor Seegers, and then Councillor Wright. I did have a conversation with uh, jo Josie Osborne or Josie. Yeah, Osborne. That's Osborne, right. yeah, yeah, okay, from Tofino when she was over here a while back, and she said when they looked at taking this on in Tofino, mm -hmm. they went from one bylaw officer to five. So there is a cost. And I, I personally don't think we have enough information from our community, given that we have few complaints. How much is the community upset about this? We hear anecdotal, anecdotally about issues. We do have people approach us as counselors approach staff, but nobody really actually files many complaints. So I think we need to go out to our community and see where they want us to go with this. The, the difficulty we have is our communications manager is now dealing with the community forest. And I don't know what, what capacity there is among staff to actually take on something like this at this time. Yeah, that will be my question in a moment, but Councillor Wright. Well, I was just thinking that we've heard um, a number of suggestions about having uh, another session, a workshop of some sort. I, in my view, it would have to be open, um, not just for council only. But and so I looked at staff to know if they'd have the capacity to have a um, three-hour workshop. And the question would be either before the election or after October 20th. Um, wouldn't make much difference in some ways because we're not going to be able to deal with the issue this summer, anyways. But we could gather more information over the summer. And it needs to include not just council members or prospective council members, but it would need to include um, Coast Housing Society, um, people from the Bed and Bed and Breakfast Association, or the used to be called the Cottage um, Association, Tourism, of course, because they would be actively involved. And there are, um, I have been talking to the CAO about um, firms, I know one of them that Tofino used, that actually will gather the data for you and um, direct you to the addresses that you're dealing with because you can't, you can, it takes a lot more time for one of us to search than it does for people with the right computer software to search through your community. They can tell you very quickly exactly where they're located, who's running them, and, and where that is. So that's one option. So the question to staff would be whether the next step would be appropriate 
to pull together more information, but a more open workshop of probably 20 to 25 people who were interested on the, on the issue to actually discuss the direction the District of Seychelles should go on this and whether the staff capacity would be in 2018 over the next 90 days or after November. And I don't have the CAO here to actually balance all of the competing interests in the organization, so we won't hold, we won't hold you to um, either a yes or a no. We'll just... Um, through the chair. So in terms of, of capacity, it's a little stretched at the yeah. moment. Um, and as you know, we do have some staffing changes. Uh, so I don't know if council knows, but Aaron Thompson is leaving us um, next week for another position. Yeah, so, council probably didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. So we're, we um, haven't had an in camera to mention it. I'm gutted, uh, and and I and I may forgive him sometime, but um, it's a good move for him. He's going home uh, to Dawson Creek. So we've been. This is a diversion, so indulge me. Um, but. I have oh, it been, answers the question about capacity. Yeah, <laughs> it, it does. Um, but I have uh, been really impressed with how someone um, with that experience was able to step up and essentially run the department for a period of time. Um, so he will be very missed. Um, that said, he'll be really missed. So capacity <laughs> um, is, is a little bit stretched. Um, so there, there may be some, there may be some options to do some preliminary work of pull together a little bit more of. Um, now that I have some direction from you, um, pulling together some, some options, maybe a few more case studies for you to review, um, and I'll have a, a, a chat with our communications manager. Are there options to do fairly straightforward online survey or something like that, that that lets us know is there interest, what kind of issues should we discuss, and that would help craft what a workshop might look like. So we could do some interim work initially. Okay. I take that as a suggestion that would probably be quite useful because we don't want this to disappear. Um, it's important not just for the economy, it's important on affordability. There's five or six different ways this comes together and it's not going to go away. So we do have to address it and manage it while we can. So I'll um, take that as a referral back to staff who has heard our discussion and will bring some ideas forward when they've had a chance to talk with the senior management team. Um, we could do that as a motion, Councillor Seegers. Thanks, Councillor Inkster seconded. All those in favor? And you'll craft the motion in, in hindsight. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for that discussion and for the report and uh, for the um, thoughtful ideas from councillors. 10.2, we have a report from the Executive Assistant on the Sunshine Coast Harm Reduction Community Action Team. First, a motion to receive the report. Thank you, and I don't think there's any staff to speak to it, but it was fairly straightforward. And the recommendation is simply that we prepare a letter of support for the Sunshine Coast Harm Reduction Community Action Team for their application to the Community Overdose Crisis Innovation Grant. And this is a grant provided by the provincial government to help communities across BC deal with the opiate uh, and substance abuse issues. Mm -hmm. Councillor Seegers? Mm -hmm. So I read the report, and I know uh, Councillor Lutz could probably answer this, but in the report, it doesn't actually indicate who's taking the lead on this. Um, they, we've, they've requested a letter of support, but who's going to be managing this? The community Action Team. Councillor Lutz. It will be the Sunshine Coast Community Resources Centre that will oversee it. And as the report speaks to hiring of a coordinator and some peer um, counselor training that will go along with that. But it will be locally overseen by Sunshine Coast Community Resources. So they'll actually put the application in? Yes. Okay. Any other questions? It's certainly important to know who's, if it's a responsible organization that's going to look at the funds. And then could I have somebody move the recommendation? Councillor Seegers and Lutz, all those in favor? And that's carried. Yes, Councillor Inkster. <coughs> Mic microphone. Sure. 
Okay, we're moving on to the next item, I'm assuming, so I'll just uh, do a declaration of potential conflict and uh, step out. Okay, thank yeah. you for that. Appreciate it. So 10.3 is on a liquor license application, and Councillor Ingster has a potential uh, conflict. And uh, interesting, um, under the community charter, conflict of interest is always um, determined by the councillor in question. It's not up to other people to determine whether one of us has a conflict of interest, but we know our own business dealings and our own um, issues, and we um, make that determination ourselves, even though oftentimes others would like to make the determination. Um, it's one that we uh, trust individual councillors to make. So that does bring us to 10.3. Um, first, a motion to receive the report on the liquor license application by Studio 2545 Salon and Spa. Councillor Lutz, I saw your hand, and Councillor Seegers, I saw yours. All those in favour? Thank you, that's carried, and I'll turn back to our Director of Planning. Thank you, Worship Members of Council. As mentioned, this is um, an application for a liquor licence, so it's seeking Council endorsement of this. It is to allow uh, a liquor primary licence uh, for to allow Studio 2545 Salon and Spa to offer alcoholic beverages while salon and spa services are being provided. Uh, the, the reason this is uh, now possible, the liquor licensing changed in January of 2017. Uh, these things used to be restricted to anyone who was kind of in the hotel, motel. They opened it up that actually allowed um, expanded opportunities into salons and spas, barbershops, um, galleries and bookstores. Um, to allow opportunity to have uh, a liquor license in there without the need necessarily to have a primary food uh, application as well. So this particular application is wanting to um, be able to provide a wine service for people uh, taking part in the, the spa activities and it's looking for council endorsement of that. Thank you. And the recommendation of staff is to approve the application. Sorry, that would be helpful. Um, yes, <laughs> it is. There was um, some engagement uh, done uh, for uh, uh, through the uh, neighbors of that particular area. We haven't received anything problematic. Nothing came in through the referral process. We feel it would really um, be a good thing to uh, move down this road. It does allow uh, a business to offer a broader range of, of activities. We are also managing it through the business license um, to have a provision in there that we would um, amend into the business license to ensure that it stays as an ancillary use and not um, become something else. Thank you, and that um, answers the question between the terminology which is liquor primary, but it's actually ancillary. And any questions from? I'll look. Councillor Lutz, is that a question, or are we ready question. to move to the okay, or, or a comment? Mm -hmm. And then we'll move to the recommendation. On page eighty-two, it says that the applicant would like to have hours from ten a.m. to six p.m. on Saturdays and Sundays and 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. the rest of the week. Um, I'm a little concerned about such an early start. I know that the restaurants in the area um, don't serve liquor until 11. Is there any way we can put that kind of a restriction on this applicant? Through the chair, we do have the ability through the business license to um, change hours if that was um, a concern that that is the the mechanism that we can utilize I'm imagining the intent of that is wedding parties um, tend to start early champagne cocktails are lovely um, I'm, I'm guessing that would be the intent and the restaurants can't serve orange juice and champagne at nine o'clock, no, I, 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 I didn't know that was still in effect. I didn't. So, is that part of our business license? Does anybody know whether the restrictions on liquor service in restaurants is just a hangover from provincial regulations, or it's part of our concern? 
when we, I... We would want to... I, I understand Councillor Lutz is looking for a level playing field. Yeah. So I'll respect that. Councillor Shanks? Yes, uh, Your Worship. I'm just noting on page number 50, 82, sorry, 82, under communication strategy, it indicates uh, the applicant has advised her immediate neighbors attachment to of her intentions. No responses have been submitted to the district. Um, I would be in favor of the following. Although not required, council could notify neighboring property owners and tenants of their intention to consider the endorsement of the license. I'll take that as a motion to see if anyone else wants to second it. Councillor Lutz does. And uh, Councillor Seegers. Thank you. We um, have a motion on the floor now. Yes. Um, I understood that the resident, the neighboring uh, businesses has already been contacted. Have they been contacted by staff or by the proponent? Through the chair, it was through the proponent. Um, so we, um, we have been notified. They did provide the information that they provided to them, but we don't have direct information as to who was contacted and at what time. And if we did it, it would be people we within 50 meters. So it would be the residents of the watermark. Correct. As well as the property owners and business owners. Yeah. OK, anything further to that um, motion just before we go any further to the put forward by Councillor Shanks and seconded by Councillor Lutz that we take the next step of notifying property owners of our intention to consider this endorsement. Any. I would just note that what, what surprised me was that this application started on March 1st, and here it is four months later, and I, I thought that was a long time to process what was a fairly simple um, request. So this is this will probably be at least another month on that. So I'm not actually in favor of the motion, yeah. but, but I'll, I'll look for others to, yeah. to vote. If there's no other questions, or comments on the motion, I'll just call the question. All those in favor of the motion in front of us, which is to take the step of notifying all of the neighbors of our intention. All those in favor? Any opposed? That's actually defeated on a tie with three in favor of notification and three opposed. Councillor Mueller. So I think, you know, there's a few probably issues to unpack here. Um, the applicant has made use of some kind of new rules coming down from the province, and that's uh, good because it turns our mind to probably the policy approach that we want to take with um, what we've been given from the province. This isn't going to be the last one. We have to expect there's going to be more. Um, and, and, and also, I just want to comment that this has basically been a tolerated practice for some years, and I want to congratulate the applicant for coming forward and actually doing it uh, above board and properly where we would like that from um, more of our businesses we can actually um, deal with the issues that may or may not arise but um, we've set out some goals in our uh, strategic plan uh, you know we want to have a, a lively downtown a downtown where um, people want to come and be a part of uh, what's going on there um, this particular type of use um, in what would be a non-traditional um, liquor environment or liquor service liquor service environment um, is something that we should probably get a handle on um, in terms of how that fits with our downtown core and if we if we want to extend it um, in which ways we want to uh, i think there's a big big policy discussion to have here um, okay thank you for that any further discussion at the moment the provincial regulations are restrictive on where who can apply for these ancillary licenses or primary liquor license? I mean, it's spas, barbershops, you mentioned bookstores, theaters, the new cannabis retailers? <laughs> no. And could a spa offer cannabis? Which would, in my view, make more sense than white wine, but that's okay. Councillor, any further discussion? I'd look for somebody to put the recommendation to on the floor for us. Councillor Seegers, Councillor Wright, and for consideration that Council endorsed the Studio 2545 Salon and Spa Liquor License application located at Unit 107-5725 Torito Street, and that Council directs staff to amend the business license of Studio 2545 Hair Salon and Spa to include the sale of alcoholic beverages as accessory to the hair salon and spa services. Councillor Mueller. 
Yeah, on the motion, um, I think that, uh, you know, I'm in favor of this particular application, but I, I do want to see um, the policy framework come forward because we're going to see more of them, and it would be great if we were dealing with them on an even basis um, with some clear intent, and then at that point they would just be operational and they wouldn't become any council, which I wondered about when I saw this, so I will be supporting it. Yeah, so we're in that transitional period where we don't have the level playing field yet, and it's not yet operational, but thanks for that comment. All those in favor of the motion? All those opposed? <coughs> and that's carried. And Councillor Sears. Thank you. Um, I notice in this motion that it just talks about the business license. It doesn't actually say that we will be endorsing, we would support endorsement or provision of the license. Is there something else we need to put forward? Do we have Through to write the to the province or anything? Sorry, Sorry. The, the motion asks that you endorse the liquor license application. That goes forward to the province to do the liquor licensing. Through the business license, it's a, directing us to amend the business license to make sure the accessory use. Does that, does that make sense? Okay. Baby steps to a more liberal world. Housekeeping matters. Uh, no, we don't. We're now at. Re Could somebody let uh, Councillor Engster know that his conflict of interest is now over? I think he's gone. He's probably taken. Oh, is he taking his books? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If he's not there, we'll continue. We have a quorum, and the next item is council reports, and that's why I thought of Councillor Engster because he always has something to report. So I'll start with Councillor Engster, who is absent, and then ask Councillor Shanks if he has anything he'd like to report. Um, Your Worship, uh, not a whole lot, uh, just a very exciting July 1st uh, weekend with the parade and the entertainment that was provided at Hackett Park and on Cowrie Street. Um, just so interesting to see our demographics uh, changing and, and ethnic dancing that we've probably never seen before. And so I was, I, I was there for three and a half hours just listening or watching the, the different uh, dancers that uh, appeared, plus the other entertainment. So all in all, uh, an exceptionally good weekend, huge turnout of uh, people watching, and that's always good to see. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much for that report, and we look forward to the next long weekend in the summer, which will be just as big. Councillor Lutz. Thank you. Um, I took part in the Pride Parade at uh, Mission Point. It was extremely well attended. Also, uh, the Multicultural Festival. I was there for the last couple of hours of it and was really impressed with how colorful and how much fun it was. And got to hear a couple of testimonials from people who had immigrated here to the Sunshine Coast from different parts of the world, and that was really um, quite moving. I also attended the alternate school's graduation ceremony at the Seashell Indian Band Hall, and that was a very small group of graduates but uh, enthusiastic and proud of the work they'd done to listen to the teachers and the other workers who had worked with these students for the last number of years. It was really encouraging. Uh, July 1st parade was pretty incredible. First time in 10 years that I wasn't there to cut the cake. I was at the community forest booth um, answering questions and meeting with people. So it seemed like my July 1st was unfinished, not getting to hand out that cake, but next year for sure. That's my report. Thank you for that report. And Councillor Mueller. Yeah, thank you. Um, other than the regular council meetings, I don't have too much to report in terms of council work. I was up in Powell River. Uh, visiting our neighbors for the Canada Day weekend. It was good. Got to go and tour the farmer's market. And if any of you have not done that, you should check out the Power River Farmer's Market. They're doing some things there that, that we're not doing. I mean, it, it's just it's one of the best around, I think. I always enjoy my time there. Um, 
but uh, in terms of what I'd like to report, I think that um, the community is starting to get ready for the election time that I, I referenced before, and I'm seeing more of the buzz um, in social media. People are more interested. Um, people are coming out to talk to me more than they have. Um, definitely a marked change because it felt like there was a bit of a lull there for a few years. People just had fatigue or something like that. But um, I just wanted to say a word about that because there have been people reaching out to me trying to decide um, if they want to play a role and um, what the what I can say about the experience. And I would have I would be happy to talk to any of those people. I really think and I believe that. Um, Council and town council in particular is a collegiate and I would be uh, happy to support with my experience anyone who was interested in running um, and that goes beyond Seashell because I think that the people sitting here are, are a tremendous resource um, in terms of learning how to be a councillor and uh, I think that um, this is a fantastic community to be on town council in. I think the divisions, they really get overplayed sometimes, um, particularly in the media and in social media. Um, and and it's, it's serving over here is, a, is, a, is an honour and it's a pleasure. And I, I recommend it to anyone, if you really care about your community, it's a great place to make a difference. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Councillor Mueller. Councillor Seegers. Thank you. June 21st, I caught the tail end of the Indigenous Peoples Day. I got stuck for an hour in on the Davis Bay Hill with the uh, little fender bender that happened. So I just caught the end of that. Um, attended a library board meeting. Uh, we're looking forward to the new librarian coming. Her first day is the 17th. You'll see some information coming forward in the papers in the next week. Um, I attended the Salmonid Volunteer Appreciation Party um, more so to say goodbye to two members of our community who are leaving. Uh, the manager there uh, got a job up in Powell River, or in um, Port Hardy, sorry, Port Hardy. So they, they're moving on. So I went to see them before they left. Um, along with the other uh, mayor and Councillor Lutz, I attended the Pride Parade and the, the Pride uh, Picnic in the Park, or whatever they call it that day. Then the Multicultural fest Festival, amazing food. If you didn't get there, make sure you get there next year. Amazing food. <laughs> and then Canada Day, the parade. I was a parade organizer, as most of you know. Um, I also volunteered on cleanup and all of that. And uh, my granddaughter, Leah, actually was in Hackett Park handing out cake. <laughs> so I sent her over there because I was still taking out steaks and things. I'd like to say thank you to the Parks and Public Works staff because they actually put the, the parade together, or the, the float for the district together, and did an amazing job. We got all kinds of kudos for what it looked like and how it, how it, it went there. And then the park staff that were around all day, there were two part, uh, summer students who were there all day and did all kinds of things, and Perry was around just making sure things were going smoothly. So I really wanna uh, put a shout out to Parks and Public Works. Um, and then with Councillor Mueller indicating uh, potential candidates, I actually have met with, I met with two more in the last couple of weeks here who've indicated that they're looking at coming forward. And part of, part of what I'm finding is, is really important is that they know what they're getting into. I've actually had two people who we've convinced not to run because it didn't fit for them. So I'd rather have people come forward who know what it's about and aren't frustrated once they get into this position. So it is important that they actually talk to somebody and get their questions answered and make sure that they're clear about what they're going to be putting their name forward for. So that's my report. Thanks. Thank you very much for that report and for your work on Canada Day. I was going to come back to it later, but good. Councillor Wright. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I also attended the Multicultural Festival and was there for a couple of hours and at the beginning of the, of the, day, of the evening. And of course, the Canada Day Parade and like Councillor Lutz, I, I shared the responsibilities at the community engagement for the um, Sunshine Coast Community Forest. So we we're answering a lot of questions about that. Um, I also attended the Vancouver Coastal Health Local Governance Liaison Meeting. <laughs> and that's a mouthful. Um, there was three or four takeaways from that. Um, the CAO has been with Vancouver Coastal Health two years now. And so um, 
the first takeaway was that the second floor of the hospital is going to be opened up to accommodate 12 patients for, for care, long-term care. Um, I asked the question about Totem and Shorncliffe, and I said, is it going to be reused or repurposed? And they said, yes, it was. They haven't got the plans finalized, and they're quite a ways from that, but they're going to use that to fill gaps within the community. And in September, they're going to open up the operating room so that it will be operating 10 days every day. Uh, right now, it's operating seven days out of 10. Hours? So hours? Hours? 10 hours a day? Uh, no, they didn't, they didn't mention hours. It was, this was this days okay. of the week. And then the last thing that they mentioned was that the trellis deal, um, which is currently slotted to go on uh, Seashell Nation land, is close, but it's not done. They're in the middle of negotiations. And so, and that concludes my report on District of Seashell. Thank you for that report. And just before we turn back to Director, Councillor Wright as Director for the SCRD Board, I'll just uh, agree that it was a, a busy 10 days with graduations and festivals and welcoming remarks and thank yous and celebrations for the last uh, six or seven days. And uh, I wanted to in particular note um, the work that uh, Councillor Seegers did as Parade Marshal. It was a quick, efficient and well-organized parade. Uh, and as to echo Matt's words, it was the best Canada Day ever. Uh, there was lots of people and it really seemed to go well from beginning to end. And to uh, echo the remarks of both Councillor Mueller and Councillor Seekers, yes, it is seems that the people are thinking about October 20th election, even though it's the summer months, July and August, and um, let's all hope that there's a an onslaught of younger and new people who are interested in in what it's about and uh, serving their community in, in some way. We always need new ideas and fresh fresh perspectives to keep moving forward. Councillor Wright, you're prepared for the SCRD report. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Um, on behalf of the District of Seashell, I attended a number of uh, meetings with the Regional District uh, Infrastructure Committee meeting. Um, the reports considered at infrastructure, there was a couple of zoning amendments and some UBCM uh, resolutions. Uh, the two big reports were the regional growth strategy, of which I have a hard copy here, which I will leave with our administration. And also there was a presentation on marijuana, and I also have that binder. I'll leave that with the administration. There was also a corporate and administrative services uh, committee meeting. Uh, basically, the items discussed there were budget status report, there was a procedural bylaw, um, there was some uh, infrastructure uh, program grant applications, there was their annual report, there was their year-end financial report, and some UBCM resolutions, and um, a financial request uh, regarding the reconciliation project. And then lastly, there was the board meeting, and basically, uh, the regional district, everything that's discussed in committee comes as a recommendation and the board meetings are much shorter than, than our council meetings and you approve uh, the recommendations or pull them out um, as the case may be to discuss them separately. And then there was a couple of zoning OCP amendments and that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you and the only other part of the SCRD business at the moment is that all of their attention is placed on the alternate approval process for meters. And I can just say that staff are concerned uh, that it won't have community support. Uh, some directors are concerned. The directors from the District of Seashell, being Democrats, are happy to listen to the community, whatever they might say. <laughs> Items for information or release. Item 12, 12.1, a motion to release the um, information from closed meeting. Councillor Lutz, Councillor Seegers, thank you. And that releases um, recommendations from the Sunshine Coast Community Forest regarding um, legacy fund grants. Gibson's Landing Heritage Society be awarded $21,292 for the Heritage Playhouse Lighting. Sunshine Coast Search and Rescue Society be awarded $50,000 for a hall expansion project. That's for um, their field road site. 
Sunshine Coast Botanical Garden be awarded $22,400 for their mountainside habitat garden, and the Serendipity Daycare, which is in Pender Harbor, be awarded $7,000 for permanent playground equipment and a commercial fridge. And Council Correspondence, item 12.2, a motion to receive. Thank you. And we have four items. Any of those that councillors would like to see brought forward? And I would, Councillor Mueller, you'll probably get to yeah, it. Yeah, item four, I think you're Thanks. probably looking at. Um, we, we, we've been collecting money for affordable housing. We've ac accumulated um, a fund for it, and we have not yet identified a project, but this is something that might uh, get the wheels turning, and I'm hoping that staff will be able to take this and um, and get working on it because uh, I, I think that we all understand it's a huge issue, and if we can pull off at least one project, um, I'll be ha I'll be very happy. So we can take that as a motion to refer item four correspondence, which is an email from Pam Goldsmith Jones, regarding the National Housing Co-investment Fund new construction stream. A motion to refer that to staff to see if it could be applied either directly by the District of Seashelt or um, in collaboration with either BC Housing or the Lions Society, who are also doing new construction. So moved. Councillor. Sears. And there are other. Um, and, or, and other there are projects. others in the community as well who are looking at projects. Good. I think three others that have not been mentioned. So would you um, make sure that staff knows that because sure. this has to be applied for by the municipality, but we don't need to use it directly necessarily. So. Okay. Thank you. Um, if staff can, and so Councillor Mueller moved, Councillor Lute second. Any further information for staff on this? But we should make, yeah. so they can contact about other projects that might be there. And just take a close look at that application to see if it can be directed to anything useful in Seashelt. All those in favor? That's carried. Thank you, Councillor Mueller, for putting that on the floor and the help from other councillors in putting some meat on it. And a motion to receive the RCMP monthly stats. Councillor Seegers, <coughs> Councillor Mueller, seconding all those in favor. That's carried. Huge increase in crimes against persons in the district of Seashelt. I don't know if that was one incident or not, but from four to 12 in a year over year. So I didn't hear of what they were, so I can't comment on that. Moving then, any further business and motion to adjourn? Councillor Seegers, Councillor Mueller, all those in favor? That's carried. And public question and comment period. We'll start with Pam, then go to George, and then go I there. I just have two things to say. One about the um, baseball uh, card. Yes. Always played baseball.